as we continue this winter sermon series on healing, today we are going to look at the ways that Christ makes us whole by healing our relationships, our relationships. I'm going to invite you as you are able to stand as I read the gospel, chapter Luke, uh, Luke chapter 7. We rise to receive the gospel because it is through the words of the gospel that Christ in his risen form is most present to us. And so we stand to greet him and to honor him in our midst here today. Jesus has been going around town and through the countryside and has uh, accomplished numerous healing ministries and the crowd is gathering and getting larger and larger, anticipating his every move. They don't want to miss anything. And so now he comes to a place called Nain. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. My brothers and sisters, this is the living word from our living God. Let us all say, Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to. You anticipate. Let us pray together. To those who are mourning, bring hope. To those who are hurting, bring your healing. To those who have experienced fractured, broken relationships, bring your power to restore and heal us, O oh God. By your words, by your power, make us whole again, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A woman was driving up here along Michigan Avenue when she came upon a funeral procession. It must have been a mile long. At the front of the line, five trucks full of flowers led the way out of town to the cemetery. She wasn't sure who the departed was, but decided it had to be someone extremely important, so she joined the procession to pay her respects. She arrived at the graveside and found a big crowd there. The preacher gave a eulogy, reminding people how special the departed had been, how full of meaning was that life, and how much the deceased would be remembered and missed by all, he said, I know it's a shock to all of us how quickly the end came. We did not see it coming. We can only hope the end came without much pain. Curious now, 
The woman turned to another person in the crowd and asked, Who died? The other bystander said, Don't you know? It was a marriage. Love died. And the crowd, crowd stood and watched as they buried another dead relationship. It's not just people who die. It's not just the physical body that can grow cold and lifeless, is it? Death can come to our relationships as deadly as any disease. Elizabeth Barrett Browning's family violently, violently disapproved of her marriage to Robert Browning. For 15 years, she didn't hear a word from them after they were wed. And for 15 years, every other week, she wrote them a letter telling them about her life, reminding them how much she loved them and how she missed them. After 15 years, she got a package from her parents. Inside the package was every letter she had ever written for 15 years, returned to her unopened. Relationships can die. And when they do, something in us dies as well, doesn't it? We all know our heart dies a little bit when we lose someone we love. That's heart failure. Heart failure. I imagine the woman described in Luke's gospel must have been suffering from heart failure. She was a widow, which means her husband was already dead. And now with the death of her son, love has died again. Luke says this was her only son, Imagine this mother's breaking heart as she stood before his bier or the carrier upon which his body lay. This was her pride and joy, life of her life, flesh of her flesh, her most significant other, the only family she had left has died and I imagine something in her must have died with him. Heart failure. But look what happens. Jesus enters the scene. Now I want you to listen carefully to this promise. Are you ready? When death comes, Jesus comes as well. This is good news for anyone who has ever experienced the death of a marriage, of a friendship, of a relationship, of a loved one. Wherever you find death, any kind of death, Jesus is there as well. Luke tells us he approached the casket and said, Young man, get up and live. And the young man got up and lived. Well, you can imagine what must have happened next. The place erupted into chaos. People running around to see for themselves and then running out to tell the good news. Folks shouting, what's going on? And others cheering, it's a miracle, unbelievable. And in the midst of that utter chaos, Jesus does something simple and profound. Most of the crowd would have missed it. There was no fanfare, no grand announcement. But I don't want us to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. Because what Jesus does next is a tender act which must not be ignored in this story. Luke says, 
very simply. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. That's all. Jesus gave the boy back to his mother. He didn't just raise the boy's body from the grips of death. He raised that mother's broken heart as well. He brought her family back to life again. Now, it occurs to me that if we take this story seriously, we might ask ourselves, if Jesus can resurrect a dead body, can he not also resurrect a dead love? After all, the promise of new life is at the very heart of the gospel. Cannot Jesus restore dead hope? Jesus is in the resurrection business. That's the first point. But I want you to hear these seven little words again. Jesus gave him back to his mother. To me, that's a reminder that we are never raised and rescued just for our own good. We are rescued for someone. Christ doesn't just save me and you. He saves us for each other. So if he's willing to give your life a second chance, don't you believe he can also, and doesn't he want to also give your marriage a second chance, your friendship a second chance, your family relationships a second chance? Jesus wants to give us back to the ones we love. It was late December in my seventh grade year, and my parents had packed up the family and moved us from Nashville, Tennessee, all the way up to Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. We didn't own coats. We didn't own boots. We were not happy at all about this move. So to help ease our sorrow, as we spent our first Christmas in Menominee Falls, Dad brought us home a darling beagle puppy for Christmas, and we named him Boss. Now, Boss needed a lot of exercise, and his daily walks did not suffice. We tried tying him to a tree out in the backyard, and he simply ran round and round and round until he short-leashed himself and nearly choked to death. So then Dad rigged up a line from two trees, and that way Boss would have the full run of the backyard, but that didn't work either. Boss would just sit outside the kitchen window and bark and bray until the neighbors complained. <laughs> you see, beagles were born to run and hunt. And so every chance he got, Boss would slip out the front door and run his little heart out. Typically, we would find him a couple hours later or a neighbor would call to say they'd discover him on their doorstep, panting and exhausted. But I think he must have smiled as his tongue was hanging out. Well, one fine summer day, when Boss was probably nine or ten months old, he slipped out of the front door when my brother opened it for the mailman, and he tore off down the street, barking and baying, looking for a hunt. We whistled, we called, we took our bikes out and patrolled the neighborhood, but Boss did not come home. He was nowhere to be found. The next morning, my younger brothers and I put together flyers. We had them copied and then we posted them on telephone poles all along the neighborhood. They read, Lost Puppy, Brown and White Beagle, Answers to the Name of Boss. 
We stopped people on the streets and asked them to watch out for him. No luck. Four days went by and no boss. My mother cried as she said, Oh dear, I'm afraid we've lost boss for good. Those next couple days were agonizing. The house was now so empty and quiet without that crazy pup. And so finally, my father could not stand it any longer. He went out walking and calling for boss. He had walked one block, two blocks, three blocks away from home, and he heard a faint yelp coming from inside a neighbor's garage. The people were on vacation. He knew that because they were members of our church. But they were on vacation, and so their home was unattended. Daddy felt like his church members would understand, and so he jimmied open the garage door, <laughs> broke into their garage, and uh, shimmied himself behind the garbage cans and the bikes there and crawled down below behind the snowblower where he found Boss, dehydrated and weak with hunger, but still alive. He picked our puppy up and started home, proud and I think relieved to have found and rescued our beloved family puppy. When Dad reached the house, he slipped in through the front door quietly. I was doing my homework at the kitchen table, and Dad motioned, shh, to me. My mother was standing at the kitchen sink, washing the dishes. They did it that way back in those days. <laughs> Dad lifted Boss up to lick Mom's neck, and she whipped around and saw the puppy, and a sob escaped her throat as she reached out to take that naughty, bedraggled Boss. She wept and laughed as Boss wiggled and kissed her face. Now, if I could get into my father's skin, I can imagine that for Dad, the satisfaction of rescuing our puppy was nothing compared to the joy he experienced when he returned Boss to the family. And don't you think it's the same way for Jesus? I imagine the satisfaction he gets from rescuing us is nothing compared to the joy he experiences when he restores us to the ones we love. Remember, we are never just rescued for our own good. We are rescued for the good of our relationships as well. When Christ saves us, he saves us for each other. And until both things happen, his work is not done. I wonder how many of you may be suffering from heart failure this very morning. Has your marriage or a family relationship grown lifeless and cold? Has a friendship become broken and distant? Are you nursing a grievance that causes you to feel cut off and disconnected from your church family? Have disagreements over politics or our responses to COVID left a relationship fractured or strained? Has a loved one died leaving you with a broken heart? or unfinished business? Have your losses and grief mounted over these past two years until you just can't take another hurt anymore? Are any of us suffering from heart failure today? I take hope in knowing 
that when death comes, Jesus comes to us as well. And he comes with the power to bring what is dead back to life again. Our marriages, our relationships, our friendships, our broken hearts, our broken hearts. And he can return us to the ones we love. Maranatha means come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. In these moments of worship, bring our hearts back to life again. Let us take a moment of silence and bring before God our broken hearts, experiencing the presence of the risen one who is here today. Hear him say to us, rise up and live. And sense that he has saved us, not just for ourselves, but for the sake of the relationships that are dear to us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. <laughs>